Well, I forgot to bring my computer up front, so. <laughs> well, I know as you look at my body and my profound stature, you can tell that I am, in fact, really a former lumberjack. Why are you laughing? That hurts. That hurts my feelings. In the home uh, that I grew up in, we heated with wood. We lived on 13 acres, and uh, my dad bought those 13 acres with lots of wood on them, and he would have his boys go out into the woods. In fact, I learned to drive an international scout, an old international scout in the woods. That's how I learned how to drive, and uh, I sound like an old guy, don't I? And uh, and, and uh, we'd go out, and we'd had a trailer on the back of the International Scout, and we'd fell those trees, and we'd cut them up, and we'd throw them in the trailer, and we'd bring them back up, and, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd do all that kind of stuff because we heated with wood. We had a wonderful, a wonderful fireplace in our living room, and then we also had this behemoth wood-burning stove that my dad actually built from scratch. He, uh, he was that kind of guy. He didn't buy anything. He, bought every, he, he built everything, and uh, he built this, uh, this behemoth wood-burning stove, and it, it heated our house so nicely. And I realized that my dad had three boys to save him money. And so he would, he would put us to work, and we would go out, and not only would we haul the wood in, but then it was our responsibility to chop the wood and to bring the wood inside the house, and it was just an ongoing, ongoing thing. And so oftentimes, my, my younger brother was too young, and my older brother was off doing things. Oftentimes, I was the one responsible to haul the wood, bring it into the house, and so forth. It's a middle child thing. I, I understand that. And, uh, and so it was just a, that was part of my life. That was part of, of what we could do. And I will tell you, it was really lonely and a little bit frustrating when I was out there knowing my younger brother was, you know, picking his nose somewhere, doing something, and my older brother was off having fun, and I'm the one, I'm the one out there hauling the wood, right? And, uh, and so, but, you know, that was just the way it was. But then there were times, there were times where my dad would pull all of the family together, my my older brother, my younger brother, even my sisters, and, uh, and we, he, would, he would splurge and buy a wood splitter. Those things are just divine because you don't have to swing the axe, right? You just have this hydraulic, and, it, and we're all out there together. And it was such a wonderful time. I just remember in contrast to be doing it alone by myself and how laborious it was to chop the wood and haul the wood and bring the wood and throw it in the basement and all of that kind of stuff to where we had those days where the family was together and we were working with a single mission in mind. And that single mission was to get our house heated for the winter. It was a wonderful thing. And, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that family affair that we enjoyed. My dad's mission was clear, that we would secure enough wood for the winter, and, and, and I was a part of that mission. I, I was glad to be a part, well, almost. I was kind of glad to be a part of that mission. But as I mentioned, that when I was doing it by myself, it was slow and arduous and a little bit frustrating. But when the others joined me, well, the burden lifted and I felt invigorated and strong, just working shoulder to shoulder with my dad and my siblings and so forth. Now, maybe we as independent Baptists, maybe we could learn a thing or two from my experience as a kid so many years ago. Independent, right? We're independent Baptists. We like to do things on our own. Well, maybe we should rethink that. Maybe we should be more about working together than separating over silly things. Maybe, maybe it's more about cooperation than it is competition. And that's what Paul learned as he leveraged churches to help churches. And it's amazing what God can accomplish when churches bless one another. Now, I understand that there are things that come with cooperation, and I understand reasons for separation. So you can send me emails and letters and all that if you want to. It's not my point. My point is, let's not just take the easy way and do it ourselves. Let's figure out ways that we can work together. Every week we pray for churches in this area. What do we pray for them? That they would preach the gospel. 
That's what we pray. That's a, that's a reasonable prayer, isn't it? That they would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we, we, we want to be that kind of a church where we're praying for other churches. Because at, even as we learned last night from the movie that we watched, there's great power in prayer, isn't there? There's great power in prayer. And so Paul learned to leverage churches, to help churches. And, and it's amazing what God can accomplish when churches are working together and blessing one another. And really, that's the main thought that I want to share with you today, is churches must help churches to fulfill God's mission. Churches must help churches to fulfill God's mission. Can we reach everyone in Allendale? No. Can one church reach everyone in the world? No. God has strategically placed local churches throughout the globe to reach people for Jesus Christ. And we need to learn how to work together like Paul does in this passage. So how does this unfold in practice? What does this look like? Well, Paul shares three significant thoughts that I want to share with you today. And the first one is this, gospel-powered partners work together to expand God's kingdom. Gospel-powered partners work together to expand. See a key word there? Gospel-powered. So I'm not talking about churches that are not interested in the gospel. I'm talking about churches that are interested in the gospel, that have a heart to move things forward. We would call them like faith churches, right? And so we need to understand that God or gospel-powered partners should work together to expand God's kingdom. Look at verses 22 through 24. This is the reason, Paul writes, why I have, I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come and see you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. So Paul was never able over the course of his ministry, at least up until this point, to, to get to the church at Rome. That's what he's talking about in verse 22. He'd been busy preaching and, and, and preaching the gospel and teaching and fulfilling the commission that Jesus gave his disciples in Acts 1.8. Do, do you remember the commission that Jesus gives in Acts 1.8, the thesis statement of the book of Acts? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Paul's commission from the Lord was... As one of the disciples, even though he wasn't there when that commission came out, he eventually was commissioned by the Lord to reach the Gentile nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what he did. Although his practice was to go into a city and find the synagogue, the synagogue was not the temple, right? The, there's one temple in Jerusalem, many synagogues. So think of a synagogue as a, for lack of a better term, a Jewish church. So there were synagogues all over the place, only one temple that they would go and worship at, but synagogues were those local churches that were for the Jews, okay? And so they he would go into a city, and he'd find a synagogue, and he'd preach the word, and then what would happen? He'd watch the explosion, right? Every time, Jesus, Paul would go in, and he'd preach the word, and there would be an explosion because some of the Jews would be tearing their robes oh, and putting ash on their, how can you say these things, right? And, and so some would believe and some would not believe and others would want to hear more. There was always something like that going on with the Apostle Paul's ministry. And, and, uh, and then what he would do is turn his attention to the Gentiles in that town. This is at the heart of what Paul is talking about in verse 22. Obviously, Paul, Paul says that his job is done, right? But obviously he had not preached to every individual person from Jerusalem to uh, Lycurium. Uh, he, uh, he, he had started reproducing churches. That's what he did. He started reproducing churches throughout these areas that did, in fact, propagate the gospel and reach others for Jesus Christ. Remember what he said in verse 19. He said, chapter 15, verse 19, he says, By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycurium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can see the map up on the screen. It shows you uh, right here. So i got to turn this on. Um, so you can see, I mean, this is Jer see Jerusalem here. And what's the Great Commission? The commission is that they, they, they have these concentric circles, right? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. There's Samaria right there. And the outermost parts of the world, okay? So this is what Paul was working on in the outermost parts of the world. So he's over, he's, he's right around in here uh, in Corinth right there. 
and he's writing the letter to Rome right here. And so he is currently, that in this book, that's where he's at, okay? And we're going we're gonna to revisit this in just a minute. But I just want you to get a perspective of what Paul is talking about. He is, he, so this is a, a lecurium. He, oops, I'm doing, doing the wrong one here. So right here, lecurium, and then Macedonia, Philippi, and, and so forth. So this is the area that he's talking about. All right, so... And now God had finished with him in those regions. I mean, that's a breathtaking statement, isn't it? He knew that he was finished in those regions. And Paul was not ready to be done. I love that about the Apostle Paul. And for those of us that are getting older, retirement isn't a thing in the kingdom of God. Now, we may stop working in our jobs and retire from our jobs, but we're never retired from the Lord's service. Never. I look at my mother-in-law, who's long retired, and yet she is faithful. Uh, she's turning 80. In, I know, sorry, Trudy. That's impressive, right? And my dear mother-in-law does Seeking God and Finding Him studies with people in her community. She hosts Bible studies in her home. She is busy at it. She is not retired from the Lord's service, and we ought not to be either. And that's what the meant mindset of the Apostle Paul was. He's, he didn't want to be done. He wasn't ready to be done, right? He was looking forward to what was next. And so look at verses 23 and 24. But now, since I no longer have any work, room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. So we can see, even in these verses, what the, the goal or the, 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 the vision that the Apostle Paul has. I love that the Apostle Paul is a visionary leader. And he is trying, he's just casting it out there and saying, this is what I want to do. John Stott said this about this. At first hearing, this is a most surprising statement considering that he is finished in those regions. For undoubtedly, there would still be many areas into which the gospel had not been penetrated, and still multitudes of people who were not converted. But we must read Paul's words in verse 23, in light of his policy explained in verse 20. He means that there is no more room in Greece and in its environs for his pioneer church planting ministry, for that initial work has been done. His work to go and plant churches has been done. And he doesn't plant churches that sit and soak. Because what do churches do that sit and soak? They sour. Right? If we sit and soak, we sour. Paul didn't, pre Paul didn't plant those kind of churches. He planted churches that reproduced. Right? And so those engines are in place to spread the gospel in their individual regions. Paul's desire was not only to visit Rome, but to evangelize the most outer parts of the earth, which at that time was Spain, the most outer part of the world. Uh, Spain, according to one, Bible, one uh, study Bible, said this, Spain refers to the uh, Liberian Peninsula, which includes modern-day Spain and Portugal. Rome would have been a strategic base for launching a ministry journey to Spain, which uh, by the first century AD was a part of the Roman Empire. And so Paul's desire to push, push westward to the borders of the empire may have been motivated by some Old Testament passages, Isaiah 66 and Ezekiel 36. And it is unknown whether Paul reached Spain. I believe he did, but we don't have documentations proving that. Um, and uh, and we, we think that, or scholars, most scholars think that after his house arrest in Rome, in Acts chapter 28, verses 16 through 31, he had the opportunity then to go out uh, in that, what I would call a fourth missionary journey that we don't see. Paul's hope was that when he visited the church at Rome, he would receive two things from them. Did you see that in the text? There were two things that he was hoping to receive from them to accomplish God's mission for the church. One is fellowship. Number two is assistance, right? So you see that, right? He says, I, I hope to have fellowship with you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, can you imagine what that must be like to sit down with the Apostle Paul and learn from him, just hear from him? What do you think you're going to hear from the Apostle Paul? 
I think you're going to hear about his missionary endeavors. I think you're going to hear about the churches that he planted. I think you're going to hear about the trials and the tribulations that he faced. I think you're going to hear some amazing stories from the Apostle Paul of what happened. That's what fellowship is. You know what fellowship is? Fellowship isn't getting together and eating a piece of pie and then heading home. Fellowship is talking about the things of the Lord. And that's what Paul probably longed for with these in Rome, to have that kind of fellowship with them. But he also, I love this about him, he's strategic. And he says this, and in, in, in he's, he's looking for assistance for God's mission. He wants their help. As Stott already mentioned to you, he's, he, this could be a strategic place to reach the outermost. Rome could be a strategic place to reach the outermost parts of the world. So my question that I have for you is this. Why did the Lord establish and leave the church here? Why did the the Lord have a vision for the local church? Not just the global church, but the local church. We have the global church. That's all the churches around the world. And then we have the local churches. This is a local church. It's a local expression of the global church. It's a local expression of the kingdom that's yet to come. We are an embassy of God. We're we're an embassy that represents a kingdom that is yet to come. That's amazing to think about. We're a little bit of heaven right here on earth. At least that's what we're supposed to be, okay? Why would the Lord establish and leave his church here? I would submit to you to expand his kingdom and thus bring him more glory. That's the point. This local congregation is to expand the kingdom, the one that is yet to come. Our job is to expand the kingdom by planting more churches, by, by, by reaching more people for Christ. And when that happens, what happens? God gets more glory. That's what happens, right? Right? I mean, think about what y'all did today. You glorified God. If you weren't here together, we wouldn't have glorified God to the level that we did. And that's the beauty of the local church. The job of this church is to expand the kingdom of God. And one way we accomplish this is through gospel-powered partners. We're not in this alone. We need one another. Paul loved the church at Rome, even though he had never been to the church at Rome. But he depended on the church at Rome, and he was hoping that the church at Rome would help propel him and his ministry to the outermost parts of the world. He didn't go in, his mind wasn't to go into Rome and say, watch me do this. No, he went in, he wanted to go into Rome to say, watch and work with me to do this. I want you to help me do this. That local church in Rome. By the way, the whole of the New Testament is written to whom? I mean, let's set the Gospels aside for a second. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are technically Old Testament. Book of Acts comes, and then we have all these letters in the New Testament. By and large, who is the New Testament written to? Local churches. Local, not the global church. Local church. Corinth, Rome, Ephesus, Galatia, and so forth. Philippi. These are the churches that Paul is writing to, and we learn so much from them. I just think it's interesting, and we ought to have have a high regard for not only the global church, but the local church, the local church, okay? Paul loved the church in Rome, and he depended on them and wanted to depend on them to help propel him and his ministry to the outermost parts of the world. What an amazing privilege for the church to be a part of a continuation and growth of the church. Right? What a privilege it is for the church, the local church, to be a part of a reproduction process. It's amazing. I have this sign in my office that says, in regard to discipleship, it says, be one, make one. Be one, make one. So let me ask you a question. When is a disciple fully mature? Right? Someone comes to Christ and they, 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 they start to grow in Christ. When, when can we say that that disciple is a fully mature disciple? When he or she reproduces herself. A discipler needs to reproduce 
That's what a healthy disciple does, is makes more disciples. That's the Great Commission, folks. Go and what? Make what? Oh, that's just for the, that's just for the apostles, right? No, because if that's true, that they are supposed to reproduce, then we are the fruit of their reproduction. And if we stop in this generation of reproduction, then the church dies. Now, I have great confidence that Jesus Christ will not allow that to happen because he says that the church, I build the church, Jesus says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But do you want to be a part of the growth of the church? the reproduction of the church, thus bringing the kingdom in, thus bringing glory to God. So when is a disciple fully mature? When he or she is reproducing. When is a church a healthy church? When she sits, soaks, sours, when she reproduces. That's when she, we, have a, we have a demand of our missionaries to be part of church planting in some fashion or another for reproduction purposes. We ought to be the same, right? Paul was hoping that the church in Rome would invest itself in the church's reproduction process. So two questions arise from this for me. Are you a, reprodu- a reproducing disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you a reproducing disciple maker? Who are you investing in? Who are you speaking into? Who are you discipling? And then number two, are we a reproducing church? And I would say, on one hand, yes, we are, because we are a missions-minded church. And so we're sending people out to reproduce, and we say amen and amen to that. And we're excited for what God is going to continue to do through that. But no, we're not, in another sense, We're we're not a reproducing church because we haven't matured to that place, I don't believe. We want to be to the place of being a planting and revitalization church. I've not made that a a secret since I've come. I've desired for us to be a church planting, church revitalization church. So we're going to talk more about that in a minute, but I just want to put that on you right now. First of all, churches must help churches to fulfill God's mission. So gospel-powered partners work together to expand God's kingdom. We see Paul's desire for Rome to be a gospel-powered partner to reach Spain. We need to have that in our mind. Number two, gospel-powered partners actively serve and support other congregations. Here's another, another stab at it in verses 25 through 27. So Paul's hope is the church at Rome will help him reach Spain, right? But there's another example of congregations helping one another in the next few verses. And I want you to see what Paul says in verses 25 through 27. He says, At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Do you see what's going on here? Jerusalem is come unto some poverty, and some other churches are willing to help them out. For they pleased to do it, and indeed owe it to them. That's an interesting phrase. For if the Gentiles have come to share in for the Gentiles, if if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to also be of service to them in material blessings. So, Paul, before he goes to Rome, uh, before he goes to Rome and Spain, has some unfinished business that he needs to take care of. Well, what business is it? Well. Let's go back to the scriptures and see what we can see. So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, look at verses 1 through 4. It says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also are to do. On the first day of every week, Sunday, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If, some, if, if, if it seems advisable that I should go also, then I will, they will accompany me. So he's collecting, he's collecting revenue, he's collecting support for the church in Jerusalem. 
He talks about this again in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. What saints? The saints in Jerusalem. And this is not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that he had started so that should complete among you this act of grace. So we have, we have here these churches in Macedonia that I showed you on the map who were in extreme poverty, raise money to help the church in Jerusalem. We can see, and we'll show the map in a few minutes, there's a great distance between those churches and the church in Jerusalem. So the first thing to understand is the church in Jerusalem was poor. And some speculate that their poverty was caused to, because of a severe famine themselves. That was, that was prophesied by Agabus in Acts chapter 11. Look at verse 27 through 29. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined every one according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. They wanted to help. The churches wanted to help. Now, it could be because of the famine. It could be because they were experiencing poverty in Jerusalem because they're Jewish. But they're Christian. So they're Jewish Christians. So they really were a people without a country. Their Jews, the true Jews, would reject them because they've accepted Christ as Messiah. So maybe that affected their businesses. Maybe that affected their marketplaces. Maybe that affected things and caused more poverty to them. There's, who knows exactly what the reason was, but persecution could have been a part of it. Regardless of the reason, the fact is, is that they were in poverty. And Paul, in conjunction with these Gentile churches in Asia, desired to help their sister church. They gave out of their poverty, or out of their poverty to help the church in Jerusalem. I just want to mention one other thing. This is profound. The church in Jerusalem are comprised of Jews, Jewish Christians. The church in Asia are Gentiles. What has Paul been talking about? all the way through the book of, of Romans, of, of, this, of this one church comprised of Jew and Gentile. He deals with it in the book of Ephesians as well, that, that there are to be a reconciled people. Don't you think that the Gentiles who offered such a gracious act to their Jewish counterparts would have gone a long way in healing that racial, reconcil- or racial trouble that they had? I believe so. The Gentiles are to be commended in this. They were living out the very thing that we saw happen in the first church in Jerusalem. Remember back in Acts chapter 4, where they shared everything with one another? They had, they had everything in common with one another? And this was before the church had dispersed. They took care of one another in that local church. That DNA continued as the churches were dispersed. That's exciting to see. Stott said this, contribution renders koinonia. Perhaps you've heard that word before, koinonia. It's used in fellowship. The word literally means common share, sharing anything that they have with one another. And that's what happened with this collection that Paul was taking up for the church. Now, they are caring not just for their own congregation, but for the other congregations in need. So the churches in Asia are caring for one another in their own congregation but they're also very determined to care for other churches. Do you remember our story as a church? Do you remember our story? Lest we start thinking too highly of ourselves. Where's Pastor Bob? Pastor Bob, in wisdom and humility, had the vision as he came in, and I believe there were about 14 people at the time, said, I, we need help. And so he appealed to two churches, two churches, Lakeshore Baptist Church and First Baptist Church in Zealand. I was actually on staff at Lakeshore Baptist Church, and Lakeshore Baptist Church had the audacity to say no to Pastor Bob. I'm a little irritated about that. 
But First Baptist Church graciously said, yes, we will. And they, they walked through a very deliberate process of this church closing its doors for a year and a half, being assumed into First Baptist Church as a part of their congregation, and then after a year and a half being relaunched as a congregation back here in Allendale. So Pastor Bob had the vision to see that, and First Baptist bought into that vision, and here we are today. One church helping another church. We're, we're the recipients of that. 75 to 80 percent of churches like ours are in decline and closing. I know you're getting tired of hearing me say that, but I just think that is a startling statistic. I think we have a responsibility to set a trajectory to help those that we can. We cannot have the mindset that, that they're independent churches, so they're on their own. Good luck. That ought not to be our heart. Thank the Lord First Baptist Church in Zealand didn't have that attitude with us. So, what can we do to prepare ourselves? Because I think we need, there are things that we need to mature in in order to be that kind of a church. So what do we need to do in order to prepare ourselves for this kind of church model? Well, first and foremost, we must be mature and healthy. We have to purpose in that. So that begs the question, what is a healthy church? What does that look like? Mark Dever, who wrote a book called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, has something to say about it. And I just want to share with you some of his thoughts. He says, a healthy church is not a church that is perfect and without sin. It has not figured everything out. Rather, it is a church that continually strives to take God's side in the battle against ungodly desires and deceits of the world, our flesh, and the devil. It is a church that continually seeks to conform itself to God's word. He goes on to say, A healthy church is a congregation that increasingly reflects God's character as his character has been revealed in the world. That's what a healthy church looks like. This corporate body, this corporate body is made up of individuals, and it is you the individuals of this body that make this body healthy or sickly. The onus is on you in that sense. How is this so? How, how you live your Christian life has a great effect on the health of this body. Are you living for yourself or for Christ? Are you pursuing holiness or are you pursuing your personal happiness? Are you serving and loving one another or expecting to be served and loved? Your individual spiritual health profoundly impacts the health of the whole. We see that illustrated throughout the Bible, especially the New Testament. Remember, healthy disciples reproduce and healthy congregations in turn reproduce. We must do everything we can as a congregation and as individuals to be healthy people and, healthy, and a healthy body corporately. Mark Dever goes on to say this, You and all the members of your church, Christian, are finally responsible before God for what your church becomes, not your pastors or other leaders, you. Your pastors will stand before God and give an account for how they have led your congregation. That's Hebrews 13, 17. But every single one of us who is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ will give an account for whether we have gathered together regularly with the church, spurred the church on to love and good deeds, and fought to maintain a right teaching of the hope of the gospel. Dever argues that that's on the congregation. And I say amen and amen to that. This means, this means that you must be a vested, involved, contributing member of this body in order for this body to be healthy. And I did say member. I've heard of men and women dating for 5, 8, 10, 15 years without making and taking the step of marriage. I assume that they are enjoying all the benefits of marriage without the commitment. Don't treat Christ's church like that. Don't. Don't date her for years without a formal 
public commitment, much like the Colvins participated in today. I think it's that serious. If you can't commit to her, then find a body that you can. We need committed members who will serve faithfully as they grow spiritually. So what does that look like here at Allendale Baptist Church? You need to submit yourself, and, and Jessica used that term, and I was so grateful to hear that, submit yourself to this local body. And we need to submit ourselves to regular attendance for the purpose of worship, worship and preaching. We need each other. And I'm not trying to be negative or, or rude. I'm just trying to be straight honest with you. We need each other. And the days are growing darker where we need each other more and more, um, more and more fiercely. MacArthur said this, a Christian who willingly forsakes fellowship with other believers will inevitably be without genuine spirit-given joy. It is impossible to live faithful or happily apart from fellow believers in Christ. So submit yourself to regular attendance for the purpose of worship and preaching. You need to be fed. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. My commitment and the commitment of the elders is to preach the word. We have to preach the word so that you can feast on the word and grow. Certainly, Sunday is a feasting time, but then throughout the rest of the week, you need to submit yourself to the Word of God and grow in it on your own. And if you don't know how to do that, we want to help you with that. That's a great honor of ours. We also need to submit ourselves to be part of a connection group or equipping class and a family chat. I mention this in, in our membership class every time, that be a part of a connection group. That's where you're going to build relationships with one another. Some of you might be feeling lonely because you're not fellowshipping in the true sense. And so I want to encourage you, sign up for a connection group. Equipping class. We had a wonderful time in our equipping class. I can only imagine Dave's class today going through the book of Acts. What, a, what, an, amazing, what an amazing journey that is to go through the book of Acts. We're talking about apologetics. We're purposely giving you tools for your toolbox so that you can navigate through the challenges of this life. We're, do, we're not doing this stuff because we're bored. We're doing it for you. We're doing it to equip you. And that's what the Bible says in Ephesians 4.11. Our job is to equip you for the work of the ministry. So come to these things. And then submit yourself to serving in an area where God can use your gifts and grow this body. We have ministries that are suffering because people won't join this body and serve in the areas that they're gifted. And so we have members that are languishing, trying to, trying to get the ministry done. And they're doing it at great costs to themselves when all of us could be taking up a little work and getting much accomplished. Brothers, sisters, church is not a buffet where you get to pick and choose what brings you fulfillment. Church, church is not that. Church is a respite from the war. Where, where we encourage one another and build each other up in our most holy faith. Why wouldn't you want to serve in the youth ministry and help these younger believers survive the onslaught of worldly influence that they are inundated with every day? They need you. They need you. Parents need you to help them. That's the point of Drive Faith Home. Why wouldn't you want to serve in that way? Why wouldn't you want to walk alongside the children of our church and help them understand the basics of our faith? Why wouldn't you want to put yourself out and help in any way possible using the gifts that God has entrusted you to ensure the overall health of this body? You are part of this body for a reason. We need you. God has equipped you. And we want to help you grow in the way that you have been equipped. Isn't Christ's bride worth it to you? I hope so. 
And we pursue these things. As we do, we will grow healthier and healthier so that we can reproduce, so that we can revitalize and help other bodies not only survive, but thrive. Listen, churches must help churches fulfill God's mission. Gospel-powered partners work together to expand the kingdom and and they actively serve and support other congregations. But it's got to happen here before it can happen there. We're trying to raise up leaders. And you think, oh man, we have different ways we're trying to raise up leaders. That's why Pastor Larry's coming to help us raise up more leaders. Well, what if we have all these leaders and we don't know what to do with them? Ah, I got an idea. Let's send them out. Let's do it again somewhere else. That's what Paul did. Maybe that's what we should do as well. And then number three. Number three, and I'll do this quickly. Gospel-powered partners cultivate spiritual growth to bless and strengthen multiple congregations. Look at verses 28 and 29. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered them to you, what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in fullness, in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So, Paul was a busy missionary pastor, a church planter. His accomplishments are breathtaking, and he wasn't finished, as I mentioned. Paul was always about edifying, building, discipling, helping people and congregations grow in Christ-likeness. And he actually felt compelled to bring that, bring that donation to them. So he's going way out of his way. Look at this. He is over here. Right? He's in Corinth right there. He's going to travel 2,000 miles back, bring that to Jerusalem, and then he wants to go from there to Rome and then to Spain. Well, what we know happens is he does get back here. He gets arrested, and he's on a fast track to Rome. Do you remember that in the end of the book of Acts? That's how it ends up. And I just want you to know that God's plans aren't always our plans. So he had a vision, and it was a good vision. But God said, eh, we're going to do it a different way. And God used Paul in an amazing way uh, as, as he got sent to Rome um, on, uh, on the government bill, I'm assuming. And, and so he was able to minister there. But I want you to notice what happens to Paul. And, and, and it says he plans to personally bless the church in Jerusalem, but he plans to leave for Spain, stopping at Rome. He plans to bless them and bless the world. The word for blessing in verse 29, and I just want to point this out to you, is translated gospel. So he wants, it can be translated gospel. And he wants to bless them with the fullness of the gospel of Christ. Let, let me ask you this question. Is there any better blessing that could be given than the gospel? No, we're, 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 sometimes we're, we're so cavalier and maybe just so washed over with the thought of the gospel that we, we become numb to it. But folks, there is no greater blessing that we can have than being encouraged in the gospel. And so the gospel is enough, my friends. The gospel is enough not only to bless us, but to strengthen our congregation and those around us. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. He says, I preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Right? And so... Paul admonishes Timothy to preach the word and be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Listen, I've got so much more that I have written here that I'm I'm just not going to be able to share with you. But I do want to share this with you. When you think about Paul's desire to speak the gospel personally into the lives of those at Rome, what a privilege that was. My question for you, is who has pursued you with the gospel that led to your salvation and growth in Christ. Many people were involved in that. Many people still are. Think about it. There were people who made seemingly off-handed comments about, about Christ to you that actually sunk deep into your soul and prepared you for the day when someone would actually set the hook and, dry, and pull you in. God used many links in the chain for your salvation. And he is using more links in the chain for your, for your progressive sanctification. Who are those people? For me, I came to Christ. After I came to Christ, I, I, God provided for me Paul Parker, from Paul, from Paul Parker from Parker's Trophies in Muskegon. And so I would go to Paul's 
business where he made trophies for like baseball and bowling and you know those kind of trophies and so every week I would go to see Paul and he would open up the scriptures with me and he would speak God's truth into me he would he would disciple me and he'd help me to grow I can never thank Paul enough for that precious time and information that he gave me and there were many many more Pauls in my life God placed them right at the right time to help me grow in just the way God intended me to grow and I know this is true for you as well Who planted those seeds in your life? Who prayed for your salvation? Who reeled you in with the gospel? Who discipled you? Who is discipling you? Bigger question, who are you discipling? Who are you strengthening in their faith? Bigger, bigger question, who are we helping as a church? How are we preparing ourselves to help other churches in need? We need to stop competing with like faith churches and start praying for and working with them. The darker the culture gets the more we need each other. Just like the church in Jerusalem needed the help and the encouragement from other churches, those churches in Macedonia and Achaia, if we're ever going to be a church that helps other churches, I truly and I truly believe that's what God wants, we must become excellent at strengthening and encouraging one another. So who are you investing in for the church and for God's kingdom? Who are you speaking into Even if it's in seemingly simple ways, who are you prayerfully, actively evangelizing? Who are you intentionally helping to grow in their faith? Every one of us, every one of us should at least have one. Every one of us. If you name the name of Christ, this should be true of you. If you do not have those people that you're investing in, my friends, you're walking in disobedience. You really are because God is clear in his word that that disciples, his disciples are to make disciples. So if you don't have anyone that you are working with currently, I have good news. You can repent and you can start. You can do that, right? And I encourage you to do that. Repent and then start. Whenever I reflect on those days of chopping wood at my parents' house by myself, I get a little bit grousy. Well, why did I have to do that by myself? And then maybe, but you know what? Then I recall the camaraderie and the joy that we shared, my brothers and my dad and, and all of us together accomplishing that. And, and so it was so encouraging. And in the same spirit, we are called to be a church with a vision that transcends our own walls, a church that is vibrant, multiplying, and outward looking. This vision shouldn't just be a distant dream, but it must be the engine that propels us as we shape our actions and our purposes here. Our community, our city, our state, they hunger for the hope that comes from Jesus Christ. They don't even realize it, but they do. What if we took up the mantle of Paul, extending our our reach and and, and planting new churches to fill that need? Imagine us not only flourishing ourselves, but also revitalizing struggling churches, enhancing their testimony of the gospel. Perhaps you might feel the call to be a part of a movement like that, to go and be the lifeblood of another congregation. The possibilities for us are vast. They're huge. But it requires commitment. We must become faithful disciples who are actively making disciples. And if we fail in this, we risk we risk joining the sobering statistic that I shared earlier of 75 to 80% of churches like ours in decline and closing. They forgot their why. They forgot their why, but we must remember ours. We exist to serve and grow, to love and to bring the good news to all who are here. We we cannot just be a statistic, but a testament to what God can do through a church that is fully alive and on mission. That's what I hope we will be. Remember, gospel-powered partnerships expand God's reach. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the grace that you've given us. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. And Lord, give us a vision of what we could be. Help us to see what we could be. Lord, by your grace, we have accomplished a lot here at Allendale Baptist Church. But we still need to grow. So God, reveal to us, even in our own individual spirits, the way we need to grow, the way we need to become more like Christ. God, we need your grace. And then, Lord, 
as we grow and mature, may we be the kind of church that seeks to help other churches. Just much like First Baptist helped us, may we help other churches so that they wouldn't close their doors, but would continue to be a gospel witness for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.